and uh, welcome everyone. I'm very excited about the panel session today. Very honored to be on the dais with these two distinguished gentlemen and authors. Uh, let me introduce each of them to you, and we'll get started with just a general discussion. And then with about 10 minutes left, we'll open it up. Two questions. Uh, to my immediate left is Tom Beller. And Tom, of course, is the associate professor of English here at Tulane University. Do you have classes today, by the way? Or? No classes. So. What, what, what were you doing before you came today? I was looking out the window wondering if the slightly bummy looking guy walking down was Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> so was I, amazing. Uh, Tom is a, a, a distinguished writer, writes, written for the New Yorker a, million, a, a bunch of times, also is author of four books. The one we're going to talk about today is called, a, a, what is it, a Lost in the Game, a book about basketball, which if you saw Tom walk in, you know he's a former player. He played at Vassar College, right? Six, five, six, five and a half? <laughs> so we know who the point guard is on this team up here uh, right now. And to Tom's left is Tyler Bridges, my colleague at the Times Picayune. I'm the water boy. Yeah, you're the water boy. I'm the point guard. Tom, you're going to carry this team, by the way. And uh, Tyler's written four books as well, in addition to his latest book, Five Laterals and a Trombone, about the great Cal Stanford rivalry game of 40 years ago that just uh, was released uh, in the past year. And I think is doing quite well, right? Right? OK. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about sports, culture, and then uh, I'm also going to get into a little bit of the writing process, because I'm a little bit of a book nerd. I'm sure you all are as well. So I want to get into these guys' minds about how they put together their books. But first thing I want to ask you, neither one of you all really comes from a sports writing background. You each have your own different fields of expertise. So I'm curious, what made you decide to tackle sports? I'll start with you, Tom, in your last, in this past book. Well, this book is one that it turns out I was writing for a long time. I didn't understand that until late in the process, but um, I've written occasional pieces about being um, a pickup basketball player that invariably involve reflections on city life and the sort of urban fabric. And they're just nonfiction stories that I published over a period of time. And then uh, in 2014, the NBA All-Star Game came to New Orleans. I'm a big basketball fan. I'd been writing some stuff for The New Yorker. I said, give me a press pass, please. And I was so dazzled by the sort of backstage at the circus element of that, I thought, like, I want to do this some more. So I started hanging around trying to generate things to say that would allow me to come back. So <laughs> I began writing sports pieces for The New Yorker about the gods of the NBA and various, you know, Anthony Davis at the time was fairly new, for example. Um, which is now an entirely, hist it's a historic epic. It's almost like something from the 19th century talking about Anthony Davis. But, um, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to hover around him and understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, those pieces accumulated. And at some point, I realized there was a, a genuine relationship between this pickup game, city game, and the gods, and the NBA game. And I even tried to include some of my own extremely low level playing experience in right. the whole thing about Anthony Davis, for example, was just about the, the phenomenon of being tall and the various challenges that tall people have. We're a very marginalized group. And um, I started to see that there was some interplay and that at that point, so the book was written for almost like 15 years before I knew I was writing it and then it happened fairly quickly thereafter. And Tyler, what, what made you pick that game I mean, most of your most of your books in the past are political back. You know, your political background dealt with politics. I know you wrote a book about your father, but why this game? Hello, everybody. First of all, thanks for coming. Um, so uh, I have a day job where I'm. I, I guess I'm like the chief political reporter for the Times Picayune Advocate, and um, a lot of days I write a story. And I, I view what I do, uh, I, don't, I don't want to sound pretentious, but I tell a story, right? So yesterday I, I wrote a, a thousand word story about this guy, the latest entrant in the race for governor. 
And so I like telling stories. So I'm a graduate of Stanford University, and in, um, in, in uh, June of 1982, I graduated. And, and, and in my four years at Stanford, I played in the Leland Stanford Junior University Marching Band, which does not march. <laughs> On November 20th, 1982, for the first time, I'm at, you know, I've just graduated. I'm at a party in Washington, D.C. of Stanford grads and Cal grads. They're playing the 85th version of the big game. It's like Harvard, Yale, Auburn, Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma. It's a big deal. They've been doing this now for 85 years. And I'm with there with my Stanford buddies, and we're drinking a little bit. Maybe we drank a little more than a little bit. We we're enjoying the game. And then right at the end of the game, Stanford has this amazing last minute comeback. And and Stanford kicks the winning field goal. My friends and I go, you know, incredible. We do this anti-Cal Berkeley yell. Uh, and we go off and party. Stanford has won the big game. And I did not know until the next day when I picked up the Washington Post on the front page of the Washington Post told me what had really happened. <laughs> so that story stayed with me for a long time. And so. Thought it would be a good book. And it turned out to be one. Now I'm curious. I have a rule. I don't know, you guys on social media, Twitter, we have, kind of have to be, right? I have a rule on game days when I cover Saints games that I don't block anyone, I don't mute anyone, because I know people lo absolutely lose their minds during the middle of a sporting event. They, you know, rational, logical, sane people turn irrational, <laughs> insane, and illogical. So I, I try to give rope on game days because I know people are going to lose their minds. I'm curious. For you all, diving into that world, you played, of course, Tom. Uh, you did a book, Tyler, on sports. I played, I played some sports, too. Okay, I was, I'm, I keep, yeah, you I was you the fourth-string quarterback in ninth grade. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about sports that, that makes us so emotional? Tom, you talked about missing a layup. I hate to bring this up as your highlight here, or your low light. <laughs> missing a layup, though, and you, you said it kind of haunted you. And years later, you run into your coach with this terrific piece on that and you felt the need to email him and tell him and then you you're talking about tears welling up in your eyes years later about that loss so what is it about sports that makes us so emotional you take that first <laughs> you're the deep thinker here you're a professor you go first well first of all Jeff you're being so kind to call out my playing experience but uh, fear, you know just to be factual about this, there's no confusing my career as an athlete with, never mind NBA, like Division I athletes. All that gave me is uh, a desire to kind of redeem myself later, because I still play, and some appreciation for what, you know, the, the worst man on an NBA team is capable of. Um, so I just want to be clear, because you're being very respectful about, you know, Tom, you played after all, and it's like, you know, it's a, don't, I'm not, I have zero credibility as a big time player. I, I was on the court a few times <laughs> with serious players. And so let me just di sure. go down that road. There was a guy, you know, there's just been some news out of the Big East to keep this in a sports moment. The Big East, this once illustrious college basketball, um, what do we call this, conference. And it's kind of devolved. And Patrick Ewing from Georgetown just got fired as a coach. Jim Boheim, the Syracuse guy, just got fired as a coach. And, uh, but back in the day, Lou Carnesecca and St. John's had this great team with Chris Mullen and a guy named Walter Berry, who was like a New York City legend. And one time I was on the court guarding Walter Berry for two minutes. And I just found out that Walter Berry was famous for having this contemptuous expression as a default that you're like a piece of shit and he's just gonna look at you like that. I didn't know that, I thought that was special just for me because I had the ball under the basket with Walter Berry presumably guarding me and I went into this mad series of pump fakes during which he just looked at me like, who is this clown? I'm not even gonna take the trouble to blink. And then finally I scored the basket and then that was the end of it. So, um, that's not at all an answer to your question, but it's what I have to yeah, offer. You're, at the you're moment. evading the question. I think. <laughs> but, but no, seriously, sports, there's a reason. I mean, you know there's an emotional attachment. You go to the Pelicans games as an author, as a journalist, you see it in the stands. I mean, uh, 
you see very well accomplished people that act differently at a sporting event than they do in their normal life. I just where that emotion and passion comes from. You saw it all the years you were at Stanford, right? Cal Stanford game, I'm sure, uh, is a huge yeah, drop. I, I can't explain it, but I, I certainly feel it. I, I probably feel the most nationalistic as uh, as as a person when the United States soccer team is playing. I don't know why, I, I, I like to go, USA, USA. <laughs> Somehow it just, you know, and it's not obviously not just in this country. You look around the world, it, it just captures people in incredible ways. And, and I think, you know, you, your rivalry book, you know, I, I went to University of Louisville. Our big rival is the <laughs> University of Kentucky, and uh, we're on the short end of that rivalry a, a lot lately, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, it goes beyond just the sports, the actual sports teams. There's demographic profiles, uh, it's socioeconomic between those two universities. I sense that in reading your book that Cal, Stanford, it, it, you know, it goes beyond just a football game. You did a great job in that book of, of describing all the different aspects of just that one game. Obviously you had to to get a whole book out of it, but I mean, you, you did a tremendous job of that. I sense that here, Tulane University, was a longtime rival with LSU. We know those are two different institutions in a lot of ways, academic missions. But in that game in particular, can you speak, kind of speak to the two different ethoses with those two universities? Yeah, so, so I went to Stanford, and the two schools are about, I don't know, 30 miles apart. Cal is a very proud public institution. Stanford is an elitist private institution. Um, we at Stanford, we'd call the cow people weenies. Um, they had their name for us. They call us Stanford. <laughs> um, but the funny thing is that all the friends that, that the cow grads and the Stanford have, have grads, once they graduate, they become very friendly. But you know, at the time, you, you really, you really want to beat them. It, it becomes, a, a, I don't know what it goes back to, but it's, it's an interesting rivalry. And in writing these, the, these two books, both of you all, get both your input on this. Uh, did you find coming at it from a fresh perspective of not being a traditional sports writer, you know, did that help you in your mission? I mean, I, I don't know, can just remember after Katrina covering the hurricane, coming as a sports writer, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, right? I'm out here trying to cover fires. I'm looking for a sports information director for the fire, tell me what to do. But it, in some ways, it helped me because I, I, I was so fresh in the approach to the news story. I'm wondering if that might have helped you all in some ways because you weren't a sports writer. You have a very fresh outlook. I know you played basketball as we've kind of there gone goes. down that road. <laughs> but I mean, I'm wondering if it helps you when you're talking in the locker room to coaches. Does it help that you weren't you know, the dyed-in-the-wool sports writer guy like myself in there that they see every day? I, I would simply say I like telling stories. And when I write about a politician, right now I'm covering the governor's race for the paper, and I want to try to understand those candidates. I always want to try to understand the people that I'm writing about. What makes that person tick, right? And so for this book, I wrote Five Laterals and a Trombone. I think I just approached it the same way, which was to try to understand the story. And because I'm a much better interviewer, researcher than I am a writer, um, I dig, and I dig deep, and I interviewed 375 people for this book, just looking for little details and anecdotes. One thing I will say is I learned from a book writing, it's a book interview is different than a newspaper interview. A newspaper interview is something that's just happened, I'm, I'm looking for a good quote. Um, and, and what happened? When I write a book, it's very different. I'm trying to figure out, okay, who was in the room? What were they wearing? You know, where did the meeting take place? Who said what? I'm trying to recreate this scene. I don't, I don't want to, I generally don't want a good quote. I want to just understand what happened and piece it together. And I say both of you all have a tremendous attention to detail. Both of your writing, incredible, like your, your profiles of these players, because I think you played the game, Again, back to your same subject. You, you had, that was so good. Yeah, your incredible ability to describe <laughs> certain players, Zion Williamson in particular, who I've seen a lot. Uh, obviously, uh, Jokic, uh, Nik Nikola, Nikola Jokic. Jokic. I, I struggled with that one. My spirit animal. 
How did, how did that help you, Tom? And um, you know, in respect to Jeff, a serious sports writer, I had the sense that um, this is a very uh, particular gig to be a sports writer with all these very particular um, skills that are required, cultivating sources in the organization, trying to develop a relationship with players that they'll talk to you, um, mixing, and I actually almost want to throw your question back to you, mixing, you know, Jeff is totally immersed in the Saints, but I assume whatever your actual feelings are that when you're attending a Saints game, you have to present a somewhat professional, neutral, so there might be some tension there, which I thought might be interesting to hear about. But the way I approached this was the lanes that are, the main stories are being covered, and I don't want to duplicate the guy from ESPN, the guy from the Times pick, Christian Clark, I think is terrific. Um, so I just tried to gravitate to these strange corners of things. I was always very interested in this Jimmy Breslin anecdote. Uh, Breslin, the columnist, famous, his famous piece about the John F. Kennedy's funeral oh, yeah. where there's like 500 reporters at the grave and he walks 50 feet away and the guys who dug the grave and he interviews them. So I tried to sort of take that ethos and wander over to the more obscure figures in the locker room or just at least pay attention to them. Um, I'm still obsessed with this moment. I don't, I'm not going to presume any deep familiarity with the Pelicans, but there was a player here for a while named Luke Babbitt out of Nevada, a shooter. And one day, everyone's hovering around Anthony Davis and the guy in the corner with his back, something is happening. Something's going on over there. So I went over, waited, and I was like, excuse me, you know, and he, he was struggling with his finger, and it turns out he jammed his finger and he, he couldn't get his wedding ring on. So I sort of chatted with him a bit while he struggled trying to get the wedding ring on, trying to work up the nerve to ask, like, why is it so important, man? Like, let the finger stop swelling. You know what I mean? That's kind of a personal question. You know, is your wife going to be mad? Like, that's not appropriate. But those are the sort of things that I tried to wander over to because the professionals were handling the main story. And where do you all write? Where's your writing cubbyhole? Do you write in? Did you write this book in a coffee shop at all? Did you do it in your, you have a home office? Do you like noise? Do you like music, classical music? I'm always curious about the writing process. You, Tyler. I write anywhere. <laughs> I spent a number of years as a foreign correspondent. Um, you know, there you get off a plane and you go to a hotel and you might start writing right away. So uh, I was fortunate to have a fellowship in this case to write five laterals and a trombone at the University of Pennsylvania. So I would take the, the subway every morning to Penn, and by that time I had done all the interviews, these 375 interviews, and I would set a goal of writing 2,000 words a day and just like grind it. But I can listen to music, I, I, I you know, things, noi things that might bother other people, I just, I just get focused. But you, Tom? I feel, the way I feel is that I actually never write, and I always need to be writing, and I'm not doing it, so I can't report on what's happening. It's obviously happened sometimes. Um, but I want to come back to your first question, because I'm genuinely interested in how that works for you about, you're talking about all the emotion and what that's like, and, and you're in this funny position where you're, again, totally immersed in, and you're sort of writing from the point of view of a local, so you want good things for the saints, but like, what's it like for you? What's your demeanor when you're covering these games? Something great. Uh, I, I don't. I don't care at all about that, if the Saints win or lose. I mean, I, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. So when I moved down here, I have uh, you know dissonance in that regard. But obviously, when you're at the Super Bowl, you root for the story, right? I mean, the better story that year was the Saints winning the Super Bowl for us. And uh, so obviously, I'm rooting for that. But I wrote uh, a, a Saints win the Super Bowl column at the pool that day, and I wrote. A Saints lose the Super Bowl column. Well, I was prepared because it's a crushing deadline, but I really have no. God, I'd love to read that one. I'd love to read the ghost, <laughs> the ghost column that never ran. But I, I'm curious about this though. You know, one thing, one of the when I started my journalism career it was down in Florida, and Dave Barry was big at the time. You know, know Dave Barry, the Greek, you know, humor humor columnist for the Miami Herald. And he's a huge basketball fan, and uh, he wrote a, a story for the Miami Tropic, which was there. Sunday Magazine for the Miami Herald. He was a huge fan of Grant Long. Grant Long back then, kind of an obscure role player. And by NBA standards, 
he was a terrible offensive player. They didn't even run plays for him. He was a rebounder and a defender. But Dave got to know him so well that he would go out and play pickup ball with Grant Long in, in the offseason. And he said Grant Long was the best offensive player he's ever been with on the court. He could shoot better than anybody he'd ever seen. And he wrote this in incredible piece about how good Grant Long was. And I, I wanted to ask you about that because one of the things I struggle with sometimes in our business is trying to relate just how incredibly talented these athletes are. I think sometimes it's very difficult to do. But for you, you do a tremendous job of that in your profiles of, of speaking to some of these nuanced things with Zion Williamson about how you know, good a passer he is. And there's just a lot of, of sophistication in that. And I wonder if, the, if that's a challenge to you when you write to try and put that into perspective for people, just how incredible these athletes are. Uh, well, yeah, it's sort of a mission. I mean, there was one time I did a tryout for like a G League, like a minor league basketball team. And it was sort of mostly like a fantasy camp situation. You had to pay to try out. They had a few invited people. I snuck in as a journalist, which worked well because they cut almost everybody at, at the end of the morning session. But because I was there playing, I just kind of hung around. Mm -hmm. And um, But I'll never forget among, it's somewhere in there we were doing these drills and some guy came down, took off from the foul line, and just destroyed the basket with two hands, like jumped off two feet, flew through the air, crushed it, and he got cut <laughs> at the end of that morning session. Then you had the afternoon tryout where most of those guys got cut. Then you had the guys who made that team. So now you're in the G, the, what we now call the G League. None of those guys set foot in the NBA. So the amount of like peeling the onion of talent. And so that's why I say like even the, the last guy on the bench at an NBA team or on an NFL team is just functioning at such an insane athletic level. And also it's so precipitous there. Think about, it. I'm familiar with the NBA, not the NFL, so it's different there. But in the NBA, you've got superstar talents. They're super young. They're hanging on for dear life for their career, their money, you know, they're making a bare minimum or rookie scale if you're drafted. Then next to them is a guy making some mind-boggling sum of money. Mind-boggling. And it's, it's, I'm very empathetic with the guys who are hanging on. You know, there was another guy, the same, the, the famous Luke Babbitt wedding yep. ring story. There's another dude on that same team, Al Farouk Aminu, a kind of the world's most bashful famous athlete. I mean, he's an NBA athlete, but he just looked mortified to be in front of people at all times. You know, and he almost fell out of the league after a few seasons here, played from the minimum at Dallas, played well, then made money, and now he's okay, I assume. But it's like, so th that, uh, that's not even answering your question, but that, that's sort of where my thoughts go to that. Well, you know, football is truly, an, you know, originated in America. It's very much an American phenomenon, whereas basketball is a, a global sport, uh, probably next to soccer the most popular sport in the world, in part probably because it's easy to play, right? You just need a bucket and a, and a ball like soccer. It doesn't require all this equipment and 22 players like football. But I'm, I'm curious if you've noticed, I seem to notice a little bit, There's a, it's a different crowd at a Pelicans game than a Saints game. There's obviously some crossover. Fans go to both. But I feel like it's a different fan at those games. Do you, do you feel the same way? Like it, Basketball games, maybe there's a You're different. You're touching a very sensitive subject. I mean, you know, it's kind of you to refer to basketball as this like maybe the second most popular sport in the world, which I think might be as true because in America, it's quite the opposite. The, it, the when they release like the most watched TV events, never mind sp sp televised sporting events, just televised events, <clears throat> like the top 50 events, like 47 of them are NFL football games. Then there's a couple of March Madness games and maybe one NBA Finals game. That's what the picture looks like in these last few years. So, and that's obviously particularly acute here in New Orleans and in Louisiana. I think there must be like a 10 to 1 ratio of football fans, 20 to 1. Mm -hmm. So for a second, it seemed like Zion might tip that, if I may. So I'm going to ramble on. Whatever happened to the video, by the way? We're going to get to it. OK, you guys, I'm looking forward to this video. Um, so now I feel entitled to ramble on because we've got this video. <laughs> Go for it. 
he very kindly said something like, oh, you captured something about Zion. I don't really recall capturing much about Zion except to observe that he looks like a fish out of water when he just walks his normal gait when you just see him. Mm -hmm. And it's only when he's airborne that he looks like a fish in water and totally in his element. But the piece I wrote was partly about his first home game here where at some point unexpectedly he started launching these three-point shots and they all started going in and there was this big comeback against the Spurs and so forth and I was trying to be professional you know as a member of the press and but was quite excited by the first one and by the third one I was just making these little groaning noises <laughs> of pleasure and happiness and then there was a fourth one and I just let it go a bit um, uh, that's what comes to mind with Zion, especially because it's a happy memory in a dark moment. I want to read something you wrote that I thought was really interesting. I want you to get your thoughts on it. It's an excerpt from your book. You say, the element I'm most interested in is the story of basketball's mystical, spiritual allure. Basketball is a drug, as a safe space, as a unique experience of time. Well, thanks for calling that out. Uh, you know, my book is partly about the NBA, but a lot of it is also about being a, ba a basketball player, a pickup basketball player. The working title of the book for a while was The Last Vice, because it occurred to me that when you play pickup basketball in the afternoon, that's around the same time that people might be going to a bar and they almost function in a similar time out of time, safe space, mm -hmm. leave it all behind. Um, so that's a reference to just being the compulsive basketball player. And you said basketball is more important to you now than even when you played. Yeah, I wasn't very good. Like, I wasn't that motivated. Like, I, I wish I, you know, also I was playing in the dark ages when big men had to stay in the post like a prison. And you thought if you lifted waist, it would, ru it would ruin your touch. That was like, a, like, that didn't really significantly change until Michael Jordan in the 90s, um, that you would think basketball players should be in the weight room. Um, so I've stayed pretty involved. In fact, I want to relay an unbelievably beautiful thing that happened earlier today. I had to weigh these incredibly interesting panels that were happening all day at the university where I teach against my intense desire to sort of clear my head and play some, do something physical. So I went to the court at Magazine in Napoleon where I sometimes play. A couple of guys were there. We got into a game. One of them is wearing um, a Phoenix Chris Paul's shirt. And I said, like, oh, you know, are you, are you visiting? And he was like, hell no, I'm from here. I, you know, I love Chris Paul. And he we went into a brief riff about how much Chris Paul meant to him, you know, who was here for a long time and who was really in, involved in the community, if you will. Um, and then this fantastic thing happened, which is we had just finished up this game of two on two. I'm going to just add that my team won. <laughs> And the St. George's school was let out, the, the sort of lunch recess or something. So all these uniformed kids came onto the court. And the four of us, were, we were wrapping up. So we sort of were melting away anyway, said goodbye. Mm -hmm. And the kids sort of took over the court. And this woman, a, a, not a police officer, but she had a big yellow sash that said security. And she wore, I don't know if she had a firearm, but she was a person of authority, you know, security guard. She came coming down bringing up the rear with a lot of energy. And my presumption was she was there to sort of protect the kids or make sure that everything was cool because it's a, you know, we're all familiar with that space. But that's not what she was there for. She was there to tell the kids and the teachers that they could not throw us off the court and this was a public space where they had to share the court. And the other three guys were like, no, we're leaving anyway. And I was like, no, 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 I'm using, I'm going to shoot some free throws. I was so pleased at this defense of public space. <laughs> Because, you know, if you turn that around, the, the, these spaces are important, you know. They're public. They're public parks. Private school comes over and is going to take the whole thing over. I mean, no one, there was no animosity. Everyone was cool. But she, it was really important to her, like, no, you can't, you can't throw them off. So I stuck around a bit more just to honor that energy and then, and then left and so forth. So I wanted to just share that news from today on Magazine yeah, and Napoleon. It. Breaking news. <laughs> I love that you won the game, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's even better. Uh, all right, before we get to Tyler, we want to show a video of 
the big play in the game <laughs> course. I'm sure if you're not familiar with it, you're going to have mouth agape here after you watch this play because it's probably so the it, most fantastic play it, in it's the history a, of college football. It's a, it's a seven minute video. So I was listening, again, I was listening to us on the radio in Washington, D.C., which is an amazing thing back in 1982 that you could be in Washington and listen to a game that was taking place in, um, in Berkeley. So again, this is the 85th version of the big game. At this point, we're gonna we're gonna this, we're gonna see the screen. Cal is ahead 19 to 17. It's fourth down and 17 for Stanford, which is a terrible, terrible situation to be. There's 53 seconds left in the game. You know, Cal has won the game, except that Stanford has a quarterback named John Elway. <laughs> Some sound. You probably could just narrate it. <laughs> I'm teasing you. You I'm want to stop you. it if you don't know the sound. There's no way they would even think about it. But here's the game. Stanford is white. Stanford has the ball. Now, for the finish of this game, we're going to switch over to what is probably one of the most famous calls in the history of Bay Area sports. Longtime Cal announcer Joe Starkey calls the final minute of the most amazing finish in big game history. The Bears better not celebrate too soon. Obviously there will be no punt. There's no way they would even think about it. But here's the game, fourth and 17, back at the 13 yard line. Bears start to peel off. Elway back to throw inside his five. He's gotta get this one. Looks way down field. He's got it. And it's completed the 43 yard line. He did it. Jimmy Stewart and Clement Williams making the tackle. Stanford racing the clock with four
thrown it back to save the game. And boy, talk about a heartbreaking way to lose. But what a great way to win if you are a Stanford fan. Eight seconds to go, 35-yard kick by Harmon. They'll go right up there with Langford's kick at 74, which was further, of course, a 50-yarder at the buzzer. by Stanford. You have to give them all sorts of credit. Fourth and 17 at their own 13-yard line and defeat Sherryman in the face and they saved it. They pulled it out. What a show. All right, here we go with the kickoff. Harmon will probably try to squib it and he does. Ball comes loose and the Bears have to get out of bounds. Rodgers along the sideline. Another one. They're still in deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of Just like they drew it up, right? So uh, that's, that's why I called the book Five Laterals and a Trombone. And I had played trombone in the Stanford band. So the, the key question, how do you write a book about a, basically a 21-second play? How do you get a whole book out of that? Yeah, well, again, it comes back to the, all these interviews that I did. And I also copied 1,500 articles on the 1982 season for both Cal and Stanford. And it literally took me a year to take all those PDF files that I had created and turn them into Word files that were readable and searchable. So I had this created this great da da data database, but then I, 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 um, I realized that, you know, I got to do a lot of foreshadowing, and I was fortunate because it's a, it wasn't just Appalachian State against McNeese State. It was these two storied uh, teams playing, again, with John Elway was seen as maybe the greatest quarterback in college football up to, up to that point. You got these two different bands and so I realized I could do a lot of foreshadowing and then just doing the interviews in such depth that I, my whole goal at that point was, you know, I did a whole chapter on the pregame. I did a whole chapter on um, the first half of the game. And then so I ultimately try to make you feel like you're on the field, um, in the locker room. Um, so. And one of the things in, in my business I hate doing is when my editor comes to me and says, oh, I want you to do the, the profile on something that's already been written about a million mm -hmm. times. I absolutely hate that. Like a Zion profile, you had that challenge, right? Zion Williamson, very heavily documented player. This game has been documented. This play has been documented. There's, was there even another book on this? No, I, that was one thing I found. No one had written a book, but like I was talking about, the difference between when I write a newspaper story versus when I write a book the, all the all the stories, but one, had been in, written in the media. Had always been written the same way. It was always people looking back at that game. I didn't want people to look back at the game. I wanted to tell it as an unfolding story. I always had this notion in my mind of the. Remember, those of you who got gray in your hair. You remember the Columbo TV show, 
and the opening scene would give it away, right? You knew it had done the dirty deed, but you still wanted to watch the show to see how it turned out, right? And so my feeling was, you know, people who pick up my book will know how the game turned out, but if I have such incredible details, because I, again, I put the reader on the field, in the locker room, but, um, that people will want to, um, to keep reading to see, wow, I want to find out what happens next. And so all those articles, uh, all that coverage, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't hurt me at all. We're going to get uh, questions in a second, but I want to ask one last question. You're a Stanford guy, so did you get a solid reception from the Cal people? Or did they think you were going to be a homer and, and actually, slant your book that way? Actually, because I've said some, I've seen some old friends here, the Baggarts, who Benny Baggart ran against David Duke in 1990 for the Senate, and I got to credit actually David Duke a little bit for what I did with this book, because. David Duke's, views, David Duke's views on life are very different than mine, right? <laughs> but I, when I was writing about David Duke, I had to try to understand him. So I spent a lot of time going to his rallies. I, I spent a lot of time talking to him, Klansmen, um, uh, white supremacists, you know, anti-Semites. I had to talk to all these people, and I couldn't try to contest what they had to say. My thing was to understand them. So I have a Stanford bias, right, going into this project. But I got to understand the Cal people. When I was in the Stanford band, we thought the Cal band, which was this traditional band, the exact opposite of the Stanford band, we thought they were a bunch of weenies. But I understood, wait, I've got to understand about the Cal band and write how, how different they were. But, but also, they have their own sets of traditions and customs. And so my job became to try to understand all these people who had a kind of a different viewpoint, but to be able to represent their point of view accurately. Okay, that's great. We only got a couple minutes left, so if anybody, does anybody have any questions in the crowd? If you do, I think we have a, Peter, we have a mic here in the, in the middle. Does anybody like to ask a question of these two gentlemen before we wrap up? Yes? Are you writing five minutes in a victory? What's that? Are you writing five minutes in a victory on, on, the, uh, on the cotton ball game? Oh, I'm, I'm not a, he does that, Lame. he does that. Lame. Yes, that's a session tomorrow, actually, uh, yeah. that we're going to do. Yes, on the, on the Tulane season, yes, which was by far, with the way the Saints and the Pelicans played this year, I think we needed Tulane. They were the, <laughs> they were the story of the year in sports. They carried the banner. Any, anyone else before we wrap up? Yes. It, it seems like I saw um, a show on TV about your book. Did ESPN or? Yeah, ESPN um, did a whole documentary on it, and I tried to get them to hire me or to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't bite. <laughs> Uh, they put it together. The guy, they did a good job, uh, and it came out. And, and the guy kind of, this guy, Jeremy Schapp, who was the, the, the guy on ESPN, he, he threw me a bone and uh, interviewed me um, to promote their, their thing. But I was not interviewed on it at all. At all. But as I said, they, they, they did a good job. But again, a lot of it was sort of the looking back sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was very similar to what, how you described it. Yeah. Anyone else before we uh, wrap up? I was just wondering whether this goes back to gray hair, but were you influenced at all when you saw it? There was a very famous documentary similar. The headlines were Harvard beats Yale 0 0 in 1969. Well, it was Harvard beats Yale, I think it was 29 29. And actually, Tom Sankton, who was sitting there, was at that game. And he, he and I have talked about it. that. Was, that was 1968 Harvard Yale game. Ran out on the field. Yeah, he ran out on the field. Yeah, so. <laughs> You know, the amazing thing, if I could also say here, and I'm sorry I'm taking No, no, please. That, that, so I grew up in Palo Alto, right? So we know Palo Alto today, Stanford, Silicon Valley, right? So when this game was played, it was not shown live on TV. What we just, that video we watched was, was sh uh, shown later, tape delay. Um, and can you imagine today, I told you the story. I did not went, know who won the game that I had been listening to on the radio. I did not know until hours and hours later. Um, a guy told me, um, I was just at a, a 40th reunion for Stanford. A guy told me that his mother, um, he was a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa. And for the 1982 big game, his mother taped the, the game on the radio, taped it and put the tape in the mail and sent it to him. He did not know until a month later who had won the game. Now with technology these days, what would have happened in that game? It would have been known worldwide. Within seconds, ESPN would be showing that. 
And again, the irony is that, that uh, this game, Berkeley, was played just a few miles from Silicon Valley where all these new things were being developed, which is where years later the technology would be such that everything would be known in, 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 in an instant. And, and real quick before we wrap up, tell them the, the, the story which you documented was terrific about the, the student paper hijinks after the game, because that feeds into what you're talking about, the fact that uh, they, the, the Stanford Daily had. So the Stanford the crushing defeat. I mean, just like the John Elway, who I got to interview for the book, and I got him to write the forward for the book, he told, you know, he, uh, he went on to this incredibly successful career with the Denver Broncos. He won his last, the last two seasons, he won the Super Bowl. He said that, it, that, that span that we just saw, from the highest of the high, this was John Elway's last collegiate game, and, he, and they had won, and if Stanford won the game, they were gonna go play in a bowl game. His only time in, in, at Stanford, he was gonna go to a bowl game because the team wasn't very good. So he told me that in his entire career, college and, and, and in the pros, that, that span that we just saw in about three minutes of real time of going from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low, he, that was the worst he had ever had before, that he'd ever seen in his, in his time. And so it's, you know, Stanford students were also crushed. So this Stanford student, um, a, day or, a day after the game they, at Stanford, they do a, a, a show a movie on the campus that, you know, in a big, uh, like, kind of like McAllister Auditorium. And this guy's thinking up there, what can we do? What can we do? I, you know, this is a terrible defeat. And he comes up with this idea of, of creating a fake Daily Cal. Daily Cal is the, the Cal newspaper. And so with like four or five other guys, they put together the special edition of the Daily Californian that comes out and it says, the lead headline is NCAA overturns the game result. <laughs> And so they distribute it uh, that morning. Uh, so now on the Wednesday morning after the game, um, that day, just to their fortunate benefit, the Cal paper was was uh, was published later. You know, they distributed late. So the first thing the Cal students all over the campus see is the special edition saying that the game has been overturned, and there's this entirely fake-looking newspaper, and it's even got the typeface of the Daily Cal. It was just brilliantly done. That's the final chapter in my and, book. And some players for oh, Cal yeah, yeah. saw it and thought it was true, right? Yeah, and yeah, they, yeah. they actually bought into it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out. Tom Beller, Tyler Bridges, appreciate your attention.